attended council hearings in person. You've tuned in to our televised proceedings on Channel 13. Now, you have the chance to listen to us on the radio as we demystify the work of the people who do it. This is not a council hearing. This is Hearing the Council with your host, Josh Gibson. Thank you, deep voice person with a funky backbeat. Indeed, this is not a council hearing. This is Hearing the Council. You can't have a government without a council, so you can't have a government radio station without a council show. This is it. I'm Josh Gibson, Director of Communications for the Council. You may also know me as the Council's voice on social media at Council of DC. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, uh, let me throw to our uh, guest today, Council Member, uh, Ward 1 Council Member, Brianna Nadeau. Hi, Josh, how are you? I'm good. Um, I have to let uh, our listeners in on something that uh, this, these things happen in real time. Uh, the council member had been scheduled for an interview. Um, we had talked about topics. Uh, and then earlier this week, she had to rush uh, to the bedside of her grandfather, uh, who sadly passed away uh, two days ago. Um, and I, I gave her every opportunity to cancel um, but she insisted um, on doing this. And I, I think that's a bit of a tribute to her, uh, to be honest. But so this will be an, an episode of Hearing the Council, unlike uh, many others. Um, but anyway, we're going to take uh, a good chunk of today, if not all of today, and talk about uh, Councilwoman Nadeau's uh, relationship with her, her Grandpa Larry. So uh, first of all, I'm so We've already talked about this, but I'm so sorry. Oh, thank you. It, you know, it, it's it's um it's different when somebody dies and they've lived a, a beautiful life and a full life, but it's still really hard. Um, my grandfather was 89 when he died, um, which is a wonderful thing, um, and he was healthy for a very long time. Um, a friend of mine yesterday sent me a message, and she said, you know it's like, it's definitely a blessing when you get to have, you still have a grandparent at 40, right? But it also makes you so much more aware of the things that they are missing, right? Because I'm a parent now, right? And, and so I can very deeply internalize that he's not going to really know my kids. He, he's met Zoe. I mean, he loved Zoe. Um, he never got to meet Madeline, you know? And so I think now all the milestones of my life that he was there for and equally the ones that he will miss. So I think as an adult, you really start, you internalize that a lot differently than you do if you lose a grandparent as a younger person. And I also think when, when you do have grandparents in later into life, you get to know them in a different way because you're mm -hmm. interacting uh, adult to adult. Um, so I think they maybe let down a little of the sort of benevolent fairy godmother godfather <laughs> kind of feel and they're still awesome they're even more awesome but you get to see them as actual humans which is what Absolutely. they are right right the same way you do with your parents right you stop realizing right. realizing they're humans with their own stories it's a it's a good thing it's a beautiful thing yeah um well why don't you tell me a little bit about uh grandpa larry's um history, what he was like, what, uh, what, how he grew up and, and what he meant yeah. to you. So um, the, uh, the, the Hebrew word to describe him would be hacham, which means wise man, but you use it sort of sarcastically to mean wisecracker sort of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so he was, uh, he was funny, had a very witty rapport um, a lot of one-liners. My sisters and I are talking about putting them all together in a document and maybe just making a, a book for ourselves of grandpa-isms um, because he had a line for everything. Um, and, and they were all sort of like the uh, don't quit your day job kind of variety, you know, <laughs> he would right. always tease us. I mean, he was very proud of us, but he never let us get too proud of ourselves, <laughs> so to speak. Um, he was there to ground us as well. Um, so we loved him to pieces. Yeah, I, I think it's funny that every um, every ethnicity seems to think that their grandparents are the most grandparenty, you know, the most awesome, the most <laughs> totally. they can make me crazy. Um, but every, I think every ethnicity has that. But I, I definitely know 
uh, having had uh, Jewish grandparents that were, yep, we'll, we'll go toe to toe with you on the quality of our grandparents. Uh, well, and you have to, you have to picture this guy. He was born and raised in the Bronx in an Orthodox Jewish family, um, but did not live that life himself. So he had, but he had, you know, all of the, you know, very stereotypical New York Jew, if I can say, you know, I, I can say it because I'm Jewish, right? Um, but but all the things that came with that, right? So he had the he had the sense of humor, he had the big schnoz, he had the whole thing, the big ears. We loved, I mean, we used to make fun of his ears. Um, but also, you know, in the era that he grew up, I mean, he started working very young. He had um his first job, I believe, um, was at 14 in the garment district, and he worked his whole life after that. Um, and he used to talk to us growing up about discrimination and the way that he was treated as a Jew, um, and really that that had a deep impact on his path and his life. Um, and my mom tells stories, too, about growing up um, there. And at some point, they moved um, because they just felt like uh, there was too much even in New York, there was just too much discrimination and they didn't want their kids to be exposed to that. So um, it, it's an interesting thing. Um, and he, he still talked about it late in life um, because we were always having conversations about current events, you know, and he would often relate them to the things that he experienced growing up. Um, you, you told a funny story about how he, uh, how he kept kosher um, but there was a, a little uh, unanticipated loophole in his uh, rules. Uh, right. So you know, tell that story. So um, when so the Jewish dietary laws, or as we refer to them as keeping kosher, um, one of the tenets of this is that you you keep uh, dairy and meat separate in your meals and in your food preparation, and that comes from the commandment that. Um, you shall not mix the the blood and the, the the blood and the mother's milk, right? So you don't you don't ever mix. Um, in any case, his mother was a kosher caterer, so I mean this was definitely the doctrine at home. So when by the time we were growing up, um, we knew that Grandpa just never had milk with dinner, and that was you know he wasn't going to have milk with his chicken or his burger or his steak or whatever it was. Fine, made perfect sense to me. But one day I was just looking at his plate and I was probably a teenager at this time. And I said, grandpa, <laughs> and I didn't grow up keeping kosher. I said, grandpa, I don't understand. Um, I get that you're not having the milk with your meal, but why do you have cheese on your burger? And he looked at me and like a really long pause. And he just starts laughing. And he was like, never thought about it. I mean, he just literally never thought about it. I don't think he ever grew up eating it that way. It's just by the time he was visiting us in our house where we put cheese on burgers, just that's what we were doing for dinner. So, yeah. and, and did he continue to eat cheeseburgers after that? Or was that like a revelation and he changed his ways? He most definitely kept eating cheeseburgers. Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, du dueling uh, Jewish grandparent narratives. Um, my, gr my grandparents did not keep kosher. Um, but once a week they had, they called it dairy. They had dairy for dinner. And I had always assumed that was a religious thing, you know, not like no meat on Fridays, but like the, the Jewish equivalent of that. Before the show, I looked it up and apparently that just a thing was like a theme night. It was like Sunday's <laughs> pizza day. Like pancake night. <laughs> so that's, that's the first funny story. And the second, like even worse, not keeping kosher story is my grandparents were visiting Jerusalem. They were staying at the King David Hotel they weren't thinking, they called down to room service and ordered a BLT. <laughs> bacon. So, yeah. The B stands for bacon, which is not kosher for our listeners. Right, right, exactly. So anyway, uh, <laughs> diet, dietary rules. It is funny, American Jewish uh, kashrut or kosher is, is it, it is very uh, particular to the family, let's say. Everybody has their own customs. It's one of the things I love about Judaism. We're very flexible. Right. They're, they're at definitely, I know bacon is a frequent exception. I think shrimp is a, a frequent exception. Right. High trace, um, 
is what my friends, my, some of my friends call it the, it's a non-kosher item being trafe, high trafe, like your shellfish. <laughs> now, uh, I, I think there is a, a true respect for um, Jewish humor. Um, I think that's something that, that a lot of uh, Jewish folks, a lot of our best comedians have in common. What is it, do you think that, that in your grandfather and, and in others, uh, makes that so pronounced? So I do believe that it is related to overcoming things, right? So some of us are built to use humor to overcome difficult situations. I mean, his family, um, you know, he grew up very working class, but his parents, um, well, his mother in particular, his mother um, and her brothers fled a small Jewish village in Poland, which doesn't exist anymore, which is true of many small vill Jewish villages in Europe, um, to come to America to escape persecution. And they first landed in Cuba and they couldn't get into the United States at first. She ended up getting in and her brothers ended up going to Israel. Um, and then she came, you know, she came and she raised her family. Um, she lost two children at a young age. My grandfather's um, youngest sister died of scarlet fever and his uh, brother, um, he actually died as a young man. He was murdered when he was working to organize the longshoremen into a labor union in New York, which is like such an epic um, thing that it, it was made into a movie called On the Waterfront. Um, I think it was Sylvester Stallone. I could have been a contender, you know, that quote. Um, but that was, that was how he grew up. He grew up, you know, an immigrant mother, um, losing his siblings um, and working from a young age. And I think that's overcoming adversity. He became a successful businessman. He, you know, moved to the suburbs and raised his own family. I mean, he wasn't perfect by any means. He was divorced twice and he, you know, he had a lot going on in his life too, but some people, and I think he was one of them, I'm one of them too, we use humor to create levity and to get through tough things. Um, and surely that was his role in our family too, because he was always a wisecracker. And so we would gather, so my family, um, my nuclear, my parents uh, separately, not married, and my sisters um, all live in Michigan. And one of the reasons that I continue to go back for holidays for many, many years is to see grandpa because you never know how many years you have left with somebody, right? And so he would, he'd be sitting in the corner of the living room in his rocking chair with his comfy slippers on and we'd all be chatting about something and he would just, the wisecracks. Um, and it, it really was part of the cadence of our family gatherings for so long, so. When he was hard of hearing, he, he was, well, I'll say this. So he served um, in the military. Um, he was in the army um, stateside. And he had, um, there was an accident where he lost his hearing. And so he was hard of hearing my entire life. And he really was not into the hearing aids as so many people are not. So when he wasn't wearing his hearing aids, <laughs> the commentary was often, a little out of sync with what was going on in the room, which is always even funnier, you know, when someone just chimes in out of nowhere, like, what, what does that have to do with anything, but still hilarious. So there was a lot of that as well. <laughs> was and, and I heard that uh, despite not being on social media, he had a bit of a uh, social media moment because of his sense of humor. Okay, so like, like I need the competition. Do I? Need I know, like you need the competition. No, he was, he was tough competition for you, Josh. But he was not really on the Twitters. So, I had almost convinced him at one point to get a Facebook account because what I would do is when he said something funny, I'd put it on Facebook, and my friends would all think it was hilarious. Um, so he kind of had a following, but um, during when the quarantine started. Um, he's, he had lived his final years in a place called American House, which was, it's a senior living community. It's, he was not on the assisted living side, but, you know, because it was a whole building of seniors and had communal space, they had them all in lockdown during quarantine. So they had this whiteboard they were writing on for the seniors to like send messages to their family and they take pictures. And so his said something like, 
I'm having a great time. Stay home. Uh, you know, I don't need to see you. I'm, I'm having fun by myself. And um, as my sister put it on Instagram and it, it ended up on Reddit with like 40,000 upvotes <laughs> and 200 and some comments. So he became internet famous during the quarantine. Um, I, I think really, cause it was so relatable, you know, folks are dealing with so much isolation and seeing somebody who could have been their grandparent, you know, holding up that sign on the internet was like, yes, go funny old guy. Like, right. You. <laughs> um, and I understand that you were one of the secrets to his uh, success in quitting smoking. Oh yeah. At one point. So, so what's interesting to me about about hearing about your story with your grandfather is seeing where your uh, public policy and philosophical inspirations come from and seeing that they carry through on the family side and on the public side. And the, the quitting smoking, I thought was a good example. It's a really good, it's a really good point, right? I was like a little, uh, I was a little activist from a young age. I, so he was my first pen pal. I used to write letters to, to I had three grandparents um, when I was old enough to write. So I was writing letters to all of them, but. To, to our, our viewers, letters are texts that you write on a paper with a, sometimes a pen, sometimes a pencil. I'm sorry, please continue. Thank you, yes. So I had, um, I loved writing, still love writing. And um, he lived in Windsor, Connecticut at the time. And I lived in Gross Point, Michigan, which by the way is 20 minutes from Windsor, Canada. So funny fact, I always had to put USA on the bottom of the letters so they didn't end up in Windsor, Ontario because you know, someone looking quickly I love you, U.S. Postal Service, but sometimes they just weren't paying that much attention. So anyway, I'd write to him a lot, and um, it, I didn't like it that he smoked, because even at a young age, I was well aware of the health risks of cigarettes. My mom told me that he um, he used to smoke Lucky Strikes, which are like, from what I understand, the worst of the worst, like no filter, and they were very trendy and popular. So um, I would just, every letter I sent him and now it's time to quit smoking and now it's time to quit smoking. By the time he retired and moved to Michigan, he had quit smoking um, and luckily uh, did not actually have um, any lasting effects from it. But I was, I was really upset about it for a long time. So we got him to quit. <laughs> now, speaking of um, sort of public policy impacts of, of personal life, how did you um, quite literally suffering through being separated from your grandfather for his final year. Um, how, how did that affect you and how will that affect and improve your perspective moving forward dealing with COVID and the aftermath of COVID? So it was, um, it was really hard. I mean, also making the choice as a young adult to move to another part of the country. I, I knew I was making a decision that would limit my access to my family. I knew it. Um, I, I personally knew that I wanted to be on the East Coast. I knew that that distance from my family was gonna be healthier for me and that it ended up making my relationships with my, my family members better. But it also meant that if I wanted to see them, I had to either spend money on a flight or time on a, on a drive. and. And so it wasn't a, you know, once a month kind of thing. Um, it was more like a once or twice a year kind of thing. And for my other family members, they could actually travel to see me too, right? So it was a two-way street. But with grandpa, if I wanted to see him, I really did have to go to Michigan at a certain point. I mean, he was very, um, most of his life he was, he loved to drive um, and he loved road trips. And he would like, he was the guy who would actually schlep all of our belongings to the dorm, you know, at the beginning of the school year for college. He was the guy my mom working full time would have running all the errands. He was the designated schlepper. He would be the one going to the post office or to UPS or to pick up the kid. Or when I came into town, he'd pick me up at the airport. He was actually kind of annoying about that. And now I'm like missing it. But whenever I was coming to town, even after he stopped being the chauffeur. So when's your return flight? I think it's Sunday sometime. No, but what time? I mean, I don't know. I can look it up for you. Well, okay, let me know because I need to know. Like it was, even if he wasn't driving, he just needed to know what time the flight was. Um, and so he also, because he couldn't hear very well, um, 
didn't really like talking on the phone. And so the probably the best technological development that we had in our relationship was text messaging. Um, so he would, on his phone, he had the, um, the screen real big, the text real big, um, but he would text us every day, all day. I mean, just sort of random thoughts. I saw this thing on CNN or how's everybody doing? And I would always send baby photos and that's how we would chat. But we went from being actual letter based pen pals to texting buddies. Um, but it, it's hard. I mean, and for COVID when the thing was that we wanted to make a trip, we, we brought the, we brought Zoe when I was pregnant with Madeline, we drove to Michigan. Um, so it would have been July of 2020. Um, so Right before COVID started, I was in Michigan for my niece's second birthday, brought my whole family, we saw grandpa, and the decision we made, we had been traveling a lot at the end of 19, 2019, and I thought, thank God, I had said, you know, last minute, I'd really like to go to uh, the birthday party for my niece. I, I don't know why, I just really feel like I want to be in Michigan. Um, so it was January of 2020, um, and we, we all went, we got to visit grandpa in his apartment, um, I was pregnant, but not telling people yet. Um, but Zoe was there and she got to hug him and, you know, the whole thing. And then like right after, soon after that, we knew COVID was in America. We started locking things down. So July of 2020, um, right before the girls daycare reopened and we knew if we traveled after that, we'd have to quarantine with the girls. Actually, it was still just Zoe then. So we, um, we said, we're going to take one more trip to Michigan. We'll drive. We'll just stay at my mom's house. We won't go anywhere. We won't do anything. Um, we knew we weren't going to be able to really see grandpa, but they had just arranged this thing where you could do drive by visits. And when it was your slot, you would drive up and your loved one would come out and just, you know, come to the car and say hello. So we had all our appointments set and they canceled them. Um, because COVID got worse in Michigan that week. Yeah. So the last time I saw my grandpa healthy, um, he had, we did a drive by anyway, but he just was on the second floor balcony waving to us. We tried to do a selfie, but it's kind of hard to get, you know, the angle. And so I just, I felt like, you know, he, it was a long time before people were allowed to visit him again. Um, and once they instituted some testing, people could do it, but we couldn't get back there at that point. So my mom and my sisters would visit him. Um, but I think it was just so hard for him because he was so social um, and they weren't really socializing within the building either. So, you know, there was no game night, there were no movie nights, they weren't allowed to take their meals in the cafeteria. So everybody was just staying in their rooms. We know, I mean, everybody who was living alone was dealing with that kind of isolation. But for him, it's just like, at that point, what's, what's the point, you know? And so I think it was hard for him. I mean, I think a lot of people dealt with that. Yeah. And I mean, pardon the, the non-kosher reference, but I know personally, when you're a ham, you need someone to be a ham for. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I, they're, you know, uh, electronic outlets that I can use. Um, but for him, if you're used to holding a room and kind of holding court and making wisecracks and all of a sudden you don't have that, um, that, yeah. you know, particularly if you're, if you're an extrovert, that can be a real challenge. I think so too. I mean, I really felt like that personally, because with my job as a council member, obviously we're able to do all the business meetings on a zoom, fine, whatever that's, we're, we're keeping the government running. We're doing all the things we need to do. But the best part of my job is being out in community and, and talking to folks and being with them and as an extrovert, really gleaning their energy and, and, and living off of that. And I just feel like it, it wasn't until I was vaccinated and started going back out into community and being with people that I was like, oh, I didn't realize really how depressed I was until I felt better, you know, until I got back out there. And even if it's just like a 15 minute thing where I'm stopping by and saying hi to a constituent, it makes such a difference. And I, I think that that's for all extroverts, that's got to be, you know, it's been so hard, but you're right. I mean, for a ham, it's like, there's no other way to describe it. It's, you just, you don't get that. So 
but um, now you you spoke about your being pen pals with with your grandfather and about how texting had you know become uh, such a good outlet for the two of you. Um, you sent me, which we were both a mess earlier today. Um, you sent me the last text you exchanged with your grandfather, and can you just yeah. tell me a little bit about that because it just sort of broke my heart in a, a weird DC kind of way. Right. So. Um, like many of our grandparents, he was always watching the uh, 24 hour news and thank God he watched CNN. Um, <laughs> Cause if not, we'd be having a different conversation. Right. Um, so he would always, you know, send me a text about things he saw was going on in DC. Um, but the week of the vote on statehood, um, he in the house, he sent me a text. He said, CNN says that DC is going to be getting statehood. Are you ready to be a senator or a representative? And um, it was really sweet. I'm not making any announcements, folks. I'm not running for Senate or House, but I did just, it was the kind of thing. He was so proud. I mean, he used to, um, when he was more active, for some reason, he would always find, well, okay, I know why, because I'm a politician. He'd be at all these senior events where politicians would show up right? Because that's where you go to talk to your constituents. And every time he got to talk to a, a politician, he would tell them about his daughter, who's an elected official in the District of Columbia, even when I was an ANC. And he'd say to me, oh, I talked to, you know, Tim Colleen, or I talked to Rep this, and, and oh, I told them all about you, and they were so impressed. And I was like, okay, Grandpa, right. They're super impressed, right? But he was so proud. And so um, I just, I thought that text from him was really special. I was just Tuesday, I was going through my texts um, to see, you know, what was the last thing we talked about? Um, and I thought that was really cool because he got the significance of that because he paid attention. Um, and it's a thing that now might actually happen. And he got to see us take the most historic step we've taken thus far on statehood. And I just thought, you know, I'm so glad that was the last thing we talked about. You know, it was something more, mon wasn't something more mundane, which also would have been fine. But I thought that was really special given how closely he was following everything that I was doing. And, and he was like that with all of us. I mean, one sister works in healthcare and one um, is an artist and one, uh, one cousin is, um, an attorney and the other is um, a baseball coach. I mean, he he felt that way about all of us um, and it was really special. Yeah. And, and I'm sure he agreed philosophically with DC statehood, but I think the instinctive grandparent, like don't you dare block opportunities for my grandchild. I, I think that probably is part of the motivation. And great grandchildren, right? Cause now right. he has two great grandchildren who were being denied their rights and he understood the injustice of that, he did. I mean, he lived a life that allowed him to understand injustice and, um, you know, wanted better for them and for other people too. So it was special. Now, let me, let me ask one more question because I don't think people realize the, um, how challenging life can be as a council member. So what, what day did he pass on? Tuesday. And Tuesday, there was a legislative meeting. There was. So, I mean, no one would have blamed you. I mean, kind of like this interview, like no one would have blamed you if you hadn't gone to that one meeting. Um, yeah. There would have been a workaround, but talk to yeah. me about that day and how it happened and how you made the choices you did. So I spent a lot of time looking at the calendar on Monday morning, trying to figure out what to do because first I said to my mom, oh, I can come Friday. She said, it's not, it'll be too late. I said, oh, okay, well then I can come Wednesday. It'll be too late. So there I was on Monday and I thought, all right, well, I can go tonight. Will they let me in? They arranged, you know, after visiting hours are over, they, they said they'd let me in. So I said, oh, I'll go tonight. And if he makes it through the night, then I'll go in the morning. And if he makes it through the morning, I will, um, I will skip the committee of the whole meeting. And, and then I will go back to work um, to the legislative meeting because I had a really important 
amendment to offer on the dais that <laughs> is part of the commitment that I made to the voters of Ward 1. And you know, actually, I had a colleague offer to move it for me. Uh, Councilmember Silverman offered um, to move the amendment for me, but I knew that, um, you know, there was only, there's I, I was the one who needed to, to be there fighting. It was, it's actually really, I'll tell you about it. So Chairman Mendelson, to his credit, worked with me, um, I mean, for, we've worked together for years to um, improve the comprehensive plan. And part of that is, you know, anti-displacement, part of it is preserving affordable housing. Those are the two big things that I really worked on, um, trying to really eliminate some of the racist um, policies that, that are in there. Um, and for me, building affordable housing is the big thing, right? That's why Ward 1 voters sent me in. It's what we talk about all the time. And so we have um, public land on U Street that's about to be redeveloped and public land is the place where we have the most opportunity to build affordable housing because our law says 30% of what's built there has to be affordable. And I said, cool, so let's allow more to be built. Um, so we had a little bit of a back and forth on that. And um, I ended up needing to do it as an amendment on my own. And uh, it passed uh, almost unanimously. And um, what that means is that more people are gonna be able to have housing they can afford in the, one of the most vibrant corridors in the District of Columbia. So I knew, I mean, he had, as it turned out, grandpa died um, like around 9.30 that morning during the, the breakfast meeting, as it turned out. I had said, um, I'd, say, I'd seen him in the morning and I said, you know, I'm gonna go to a meeting. He couldn't, maybe he could hear me. I always think they can hear you, you know. I said, I'm gonna go to a meeting, but I'll be right back. And as soon as I left, he passed. And the nurses said a lot of time that happens because, um, you know, they just, they don't want you to be there. You know, they can sense, they don't want someone to go through it, their family members. I went right back upstairs. <laughs> I was like, okay. So you, you were ready. You were ready to say goodbye. Um, and uh, because he was, he had already passed at that point. And I, you know, I helped my mom. We got everything ready and then went home together. And we, I did my meeting and then we did a big family dinner and I came back here. But it was, um, it was weird. It was weird, but I was, you know, for a little bit, I was like mad at myself that I went to that stupid breakfast meeting, but I realized, um, you know, he probably would have let go whenever I left the room if that's what he wanted to do. So I was glad I got to be there in the morning. I was glad I got to say goodbye to him one more time, give him some kisses and remind him of some memories that we had and tell him what I was up to. Um, and, uh, you know, mostly this, I think what I'm most sad about is that he, he didn't get to meet my daughter, Madeline. Um, and there was just no way to do it. We thought about all these different ways to make it happen. And it all seemed like it was just me trying to fulfill a wish of mine as opposed to really benefiting either him or Madeline. And so we just didn't, we didn't make it happen. Um, but I would think that given the experiences he had with anti-Semitism um, growing up, knowing that you left him to pass an, an anti-racist, uh, you know, a comprehensive plan amendment so that more diverse folks can stay and feel welcome in the district. I would think that's the kind of thing he'd want you to do. I have no doubt. I do not regret it at all. I have no doubt. So I will, I'll keep doing it, you know, keep working on that legacy, it's, we all do the work on the shoulders of our ancestors, right? And the people who came before us. So um, he was one of my biggest cheerleaders and I'm gonna miss him every day. Um, he used to, um, okay, so those who know me well will not be at all surprised that someone I am descended from um, randomly used to break out into song um, and, because it's something that I do, um, but he used to do it all the time. And uh, 
So I've had a bunch of his little ditties in my head over the past couple of days and I've been teaching them to Zoe and they are just earworms, let me tell you. So I should probably sing one for you, Josh, just so you have the pleasure. But here's the best part is they were like older songs, not things you hear on the radio. So they weren't things we'd ever heard before. And he was so tone deaf that we may never know the tunes of these songs. <laughs> so we just know the words and kind of how we sang them and it's, pretty painful but they're here with us forever now <laughs> yeah. um well unfortunately uh, we're out of time for today um uh listeners and viewers um this is weird but hopefully i think it was powerful <laughs> and interesting um i promise you we're not becoming a grandparent uh, theme show because <laughs> with uh, councilmember lewis george we spent most of the half hour on her grandmother um, so I'd say we're going to try to do non-grandparent material uh, in upcoming shows. But um, again, deepest sympathies uh, on what sounds like uh, the loss of a wonderful life, council member. And uh, I appreciate if I hope this was helpful. Um, and uh, and I hope that just the fond memories stay with you and your family forever. It's a gift that you've given me today, Josh. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, we made it this far without crying. Don't start now. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Well, thanks again, Councilmember. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Take care. Bye-bye.